episode where the neighbors, you know, from Laos, these Laotian, Hank Hill's like, so are you Chinese or are you Japanese, right? And then the guy's like, no, I'm from Laos. Like, you know, it's a Southeast Asian country. And then in the end, he's like, okay. He's like, so are you Chinese or are you Japanese, right? Every time I meet somebody new, the question always comes up, where are you from? And I always want to say Minnesota, but you know what they mean. I was at a bar and someone asked me my name and I said, Rachel. And then they said, okay, but like, what's your real name? Chinese are not the same as Japanese, they're not the same as Koreans, are not the same as Filipinos or Thai or, you know, Indians. And not every single Asian person gets into college. Not every single Asian person goes to a great school. Not every single person has, you know, a great job. I can still be Japanese American and know that part of myself and know that history. But it's also okay to still identify as uh, a, like a, a gangly little suburban kid. Um, and I'm fine with that. I remember seeing like Wayne's World growing up and I was like, oh, Tia Carrere, she's Filipino, a uh, Hawaiian Filipino. And they're like, no, she's playing Cantonese. And I was like, oh, we don't even get to be ourselves. We don't even get to be who we are, we have to play at something else. Most times in high school or places like this, you don't really have an outlet where you can talk about these Asian American issues. Even in the workplace, you know, you need Asian American mentors who experience the bamboo ceiling, something that happens in corporate America. So most times if you actually look at it, you'll see that a lot of Asian Americans, for instance, you know, they're in middle management or they're in engineering, but you don't really see them in high CEO roles. And the reason being is oftentimes our culture, for instance, you know, my mom always tells me, don't ask for a raise, keep your head down. You know, when when you do your work, your boss will basically, you know, see that you're doing well and he'll give you a raise. But in America, it's not like that. America's the squeakiest wheel gets the oil, right? If people sometimes say that, Nobuko, just forget about Japanese-ness, just <clears throat> open up yourself more and be more expressive and be more upfront and straightforward. That goes back to the stereotype of like, oh, like, no one talks about Asians because Asians don't speak up. My parents didn't want me to learn the language. They thought that if I were to learn Tagalog at home, that I would have um, an accent and I would have the struggles that they had because they were shamed for having thick accents when they first immigrated to the US. I think I struggle with it even now, that talking to my parents, I think they do regret those moments of wanting something different for me. I have two younger sisters who are 10 and eight, and I really feel it's my responsibility to help them come to terms with the identity crisis I know they're going through and bridging the gap between the American culture that they deal with at school and the Asian culture they deal with at home. There is just so much beauty in the distinction and different cultures out there that I think it would be to everyone's advantage to learn more about all the different places we come from. I love seeing that these communities are, are asking for representation because it's so important to me. And I think my ownership is getting to be a part of that. And even celebrate the fact that it's so cool to be different, to have something to offer that someone else may not, and to exchange ideas rather than just try to be the same idea. I think that concept is just, it frees you so much. There's so much freedom in that. Wow. So much freedom. So much freedom in, in being who you are. And that's what makes this month incredibly wonderful. Thank you all for joining us um, this late afternoon for uh, a time of healing and celebrating of, of beautiful cultures within, within a community that is so diverse. And um, we're gonna start off first though, before we get into the nitty gritty with a couple of things. And first, just to let you know, we need to honor and acknowledge the land in which we are on. So we are gonna start with the land acknowledgement. We acknowledge that we are the un, on, on the unceded ancestral homeland of the Ramatush Ohlone, who are the original inhabitants of the San Francisco Peninsula. As the indigenous stewards of this land and in accordance to their tradition, the Ramatush Ohlone have never ceded, nor have they forgotten their responsibility 
as caretakers of this place, as well as for all peoples who reside on their traditional territory. So as guests, we recognize and we honor the benefit from living and working on their traditional homeland. We wish to pay our respects and acknowledge the ancestors, the elders, and the relatives of the Ramatush Ohlone community. And by affirming, we affirm their sovereign rights as first people. So my name is Miguel Bustos and I'm the director for the Center for Social Justice here at Glide. And we are so, so happy that you decided to join us and go with us on this journey of learning about different cultures and also learning about yourself. Because as Maya Angelou says, we are more alike than we are unalike. And so to kick us off tonight, we have an incredible, incredible artist, a man that has won numerous awards in Hawaii and across the world for his talents. Um, Patrick Landeza, I hope you all go on his website and see and download his incredible music. If you're not inspired by his music, I don't know what you'll be inspired by, but we are so honored and so, honored and so blessed to have Patrick give of his time and of his incredible talent uh, here tonight. So everybody, let's give a round of applause to Patrick Landeza. Oh, mahalo everybody. Aloha everybody. Woo. Patrick Kahoko Wila Kamohole Lenny Lendeza from the island of Berkeley, California. <laughs> my mommy comes from a very small place, Ho'olehua Moloka'i. My father came from uh, Kahuku on the island of Oahu. When I was little, my mother would sing to me and she would tell me stories of my ancestors. While I was growing up, I thought I was either black or Latino. But as I got older, I became Ma'a, which is comfortable with who I am as a Hawaiian born on the mainland. And now with five children, I try to explain that maybe not directly, but through examples like we all do. So aloha to you folks. I learned my style from the late greats. And this is from Dennis Kamakahi. The song speaks about a snail the Kahuli snail that only lives in the rainforest in Hawaii. But Hawaiians believe that this snail is our ancestors. And the snail, scientists say, it makes this strange noise. But Hawaiians believe it is the singing of those songs from the past. Let us learn from the past so that we may move forward in the future. Song called He Pupu Kaniohe. He Pupu Kaniohe, He Kalahau, He Melene Ome, O Nakupuna. He pupu ka ni owe o kalau He mele ne owe o na kupuna He ka ni He ka Kaninahe nahe di ka pepea Noho anna i kauka uve hive Moe moe anna i ka uhivai He kani, he kani, he kani na he na he, he kapepea.
Hekani 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 Nahe Nahe Ika Pepe Hekani Hekani Sing 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 these wonderful songs of our ancestors. May our ancestors be with us this evening. Ooh. Mahalo. Mahalo. Mahalo Nui Loa, brother. Doesn't that give you chicken skin, everybody? If you don't know what chicken skin, you got to Google it. All right. Oh, thank you, Patrick. Thank you so much for, for sharing your gifts. And if we're lucky, we're going to be able to, he's going to close us out for the evening. Um, he's working. He also makes poke and Hawaiian food. So if you all are interested, Patrick, what's your website? We're going to do a shameless pub. You, you are too kind. It's just lendezasisland.com. Lendezas Island. And it's an app, right? It's an app. It's everywhere. Just, yeah, it's, it's wonderful. But, okay. But you're too kind. Thank you, guys. No, so no, much. no. We got to support each other. We got to support our sisters and brothers. So I'm going to be ordering some poke from you. <laughs> some Kalua pig if you do it. We just did. Oh, okay. All right. It's, All it's right. my life. So you'll see where I'm going after this event tonight, okay? <laughs> thank you, Patrick. So again, thank you all for joining us this evening for which will be, I think, an incredible night of, of learning and of understanding. And, and I think hopefully falling in love with each other. You know, Glide's values of unconditional love and radical inclusivity are at play tonight because we're gonna take a journey. We're gonna hear from some of our social justice warriors and our prophets. We have people that have joined us this evening that have been in the struggle for decades, fighting for rights for Asian Americans and Pacific Islander folks. And we have young folks that are working on identifying culture as a beautiful thing. And those are the prophets of the future. So um, with that said, I'm gonna introduce you four incredible women, leaders, individuals that have joined us tonight to give us a little bit of themselves, but also at the same time to share with us how has culture influenced their life? Um, and at what point in their life did they, they knew that their culture was incredible? But then also I think to share with us a little bit of what they would love us to know about the beauty of their culture. And then we're gonna do a little Q and A where I'm hoping that at the end of that, we also know those of us who are not a part of this community, what can we do to be allies? What can we do to stand up for justice with our sisters and brothers? So we have about a little less than 90 minutes to do all that, uh, but I know we can do it. Um, so with that said, I'm gonna just share with you um, our four panelists. And um, we will start off with Sandy Mori. Sandy, we, can you wave? Great. Hi, so we'll, why don't we do this? We'll go to Sandy, and then we'll go to Annie, and then we'll go to Tupo, and then Fui Fui Lope. How's that? Okay. Is that good? All right. Yeah. Sandy, you please kick us off. Thank you. So hi, everyone. First of all, I wanna thank uh, Miguel and Eric for inviting me to be part of this panel discussion. Uh, and I'm uh, looking forward to the actual content of this discussion. I'm a third generation Japanese American, uh, a sansei, that's sansei means three. Uh, so I was born and raised in California. And actually I was born in one of those concentration camps which was called internment camps, but we call them concentration camps because as you may know, during World War II, when the United States was at war with Japan, those of us who were Americans 
of Japanese ancestry were all put away in these camps uh, for about three years. And so irregardless of the fact that we're American born, we, based on racism, uh, we, the, the United States government felt that we were a threat to the security of the uh, United States. So they put us all away, 120,000 people uh, in 10 different camps all over uh, the country. And uh, so I was born in Tule Lake, which was right up north, right near the borderline of uh, uh, California. And so it was really when, you know, I grew up with my grandparents who lived with us when I was little. So I knew then that there was a certain culture that I belonged to. Uh, and they would of course speak to me in Japanese and I just learned Japanese from them. And it's all conversational because I don't consider myself bilingual at all, uh, but I was able to understand conversational Japanese with my grandparents. And so, um, I uh, basically grew up in Sacramento, California. Uh, and uh, after we came back from camp and my parents uh, who were second generation, the Niseis, my father was a pharmacist and he was one of the first Japanese Americans to be uh, graduated from the University of California School of Pharmacy. And so uh, before the war, uh, he had his own retail pharmacy in Sacramento's Japantown. And uh, once the war came and we had to go away to camp, he, had, he lost his whole business. And it wasn't until after we came back from camp three years later that he had to start all over again. And then uh, after war came, then there was what they call the redevelopment process, which is another word for urban renewal because in the United States, there were selective places that the United States felt were a blight, an urban blight, which is basically where poor people lived. And they wanted to take away the blight and have a whole redevelopment. So what happened is that businesses and homes and uh, families were uprooted and they lost their homes and they had to go somewhere else. And they built all these different, mostly office type buildings in, in the place of these homes and businesses. So, um, so because our community has gone through those two big issues, the war and camp, and also the redevelopment process, uh, our community is, in my estimation, uh, very resilient. And the whole resiliency is the value that really carried us through these struggles because it was always family first and always be, being sure that all the family members were taken care of, that education was the big number one thing, that everyone should be going to school, everyone should be going to college, everyone should have the opportunity to learn. And so those values were taught to me as a child. And so as we get older, you know, they stay with you forever. And uh, so um, I, I feel very fortunate that I, I was taught those things. So as we celebrate this whole month of May, which is API Heritage Month, I think we should all really, um, you know, revet revel in all of our diversity because the diversity is what this country is about. And whether people realize it or not, the diversity is becoming more the majority <laughs> and then being a minority. I mean, we are always put in a quote unquote minority status. But when you look at the population growth of the different communities that we represent in the API community, we're growing and growing and will continue to grow. And as the next generations come on, you will see, of course, you have a lot of uh, intermarriages and therefore you have children who are biracial, who, who come from various backgrounds. And it's very important for every child to feel good about their 
roots and their ethnicity. So whether it be two or one ethnicity, it's important that they feel good about the, the ethnicities that they are. So we have to teach children that, that importance. And that really, I feel, should be included in the school systems, uh, which that's, as you may know, that's how the whole ethnic studies came about. And for those of us who were around during the San Francisco state strike and the beginning of the Asian American movement, uh, th these are all parts of our history that to this day still resonate the importance of this diversity. And so I think that as we celebrate this whole month, uh, we within the API community, especially now with all this anti-hate that's going on, that we need to come together and we need to help each other. We need to support each other. As Miguel indicated earlier, that's important that we all be together. Um, and so I think for society, it's a good thing for people to have diversity. Uh, and I, I, I do think that some people in our country don't don't see diversity as a good thing. And, and this is what we are always having to deal with. You know, racism is alive and well in this country. And I still feel that to this day, it is alive and well. So we have to always, number one, be aware of when it's there, because sometimes it's now is very veiled in different ways and it, it can be very covered up, so to speak. Um, and, and, and we, we need to identify it and, and call it out like it is, because to me, it's still there. And, and I, I think it just depends on our particular situations that we have to then continue to struggle. Um, I do a lot of volunteer work in the Japanese American, Japanese community, uh, specifically in San Francisco, Japantown. And San Francisco, Japantown is one of only three left in America. San Francisco, San Jose, and Los Angeles are the only three cities that still have a Japantown. And we struggle to maintain that particular identity. Uh, and, and as you may know, which is true in all neighborhoods, the businesses are having a hard time, all the different um, retail businesses, because retail is changing now is different now as to how we go shopping. And so we're gonna have to look at how that's gonna affect the future of the different neighborhoods. And so here in San Francisco, because we're very fortunate to have all the different, we have different cultural districts here in San Francisco. There's at least eight identified uh, recognized cultural districts and more to be coming on board. Uh, and I know Eric is very involved in, in the cultural district in the Latino community, but it's something that promotes San Francisco as a diverse city. And it shows that these different cultures show the strength of the city. Um, and, you know, even though it's also a tourist attraction issue, but, you know, for those of us in the communities, it's not just about tourism, it's about a sense of community uh, a, a uh, making sure that we all take care of each other and making sure that there's representation at the appropriate tables of the community. So I'll stop there, Miguel, and uh, I, I just uh, look forward to uh, our discussion of Q&A. Thank you so much, Sandy. God, ladies and gentlemen, you've heard it here first um, from these incredible leaders. You will be hearing some, with some wonderful wisdom. Uh, Tupo. Can I introduce, well, can you share with the world the work, the fabulous work you're doing in school and, and, and how you are gonna conquer the world for us, please? <laughs> um, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Hello, Lily. Ainga, koko hingoa, koto po motulala la tikefu. Honofao, i he Bay Area. Ko ekfae, ko panela, mono tupo, o kwa uya me. Haveluloto, Beko Kutama, Kahume Kolovai, Kotayali Latukev Tupo. Um, it, my name is Tupo. Nice to meet all of you. Um, it is just a custom of uh, Pacific Islanders to introduce yourselves and introduce your parents as well. Um, 
And so I figured I would do that here. I'm so grateful for this opportunity to share space with you all. Um, I am a first generation uh, student at UC Berkeley. I'm also a proud uh, product of the community colleges. I went to school at CCSF, a city college in San Francisco. Um, I'm currently majoring in ethnic studies and I'm thinking about minoring in rhetoric. Um, I'm also the executive director for Pacific Islanders at Cal, which is a student organization that focuses on the recruitment and retention of Pacific Islanders. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's really nice to see a few familiar faces. Um, I, I cannot say I, I, my, you know, rap sheet of, you know, uh, community is not as vast as as well in this room. So I feel, you know, all the way right now, um, I can just say that San Francisco is is the place that taught me my activism. Um, and I'm super grateful, um, especially for mentors like Fui Fui Lupe um, and like Melani. Um, uh, for the questions, I guess I'll, I'll just answer them. When did I realize that your cult, my culture was a part of my life? I was born in Hawaii. I was born in Honolulu and I moved to California when I was five. So I started going to kindergarten here and I realized that I was different from everyone else. When, you know, the first day of school, I'm introduced to everyone. First thing I do is I take off my shoes. I let my hair down and I just start eating. <laughs> I just take, I just take my food out and I just start eating. And my teacher tells me, put your shoes back on. And then it's recess, uh, recess time. I take my shoes back off. I'm running on the asphalt. Like it's like, it's nobody's business. And then the teacher tells me put my shoes back on, but I don't, I don't understand. I'm like, why do I need to put my shoes back on? I do this all the time. And then I got sent home. <laughs> I got sent home because, you know, they didn't know how to deal with me. <laughs> I feel like places still don't know how to deal with me. Um, but it was then that I realized like at such a young age, my my culture was such a huge part of my life. And from then on, like I realized that, you know, this this society, <laughs> this society doesn't know how to handle Pacific Islanders in the way that they think they do. Um, and so I guess, yeah, then started like this whole assimilation thing and then finding my idea and whatnot. I won't go into all of it, um, but yeah, it, it started from a very, very young age when I realized that my culture was a part of me. Um, and a gift, a beautiful gift that I would like to gift my community. Um, well, I feel like this is gonna get super deep really quick, but you know, it would have to be liberation, like, for real, I think I think about this all the time. I think about like how visibility could lead to liberation, and I think about how power could lead to liberation, um, and how we don't have either of those. Uh, you know, communities of color, especially my own community, the Pacific Islander community, we don't have visibility, especially since you know we have to share spaces because of this label that is API, AAPI, um, when we don't identify as Asian American, and you know, like that's, that's nothing against Asian American communities at all, but you know, I feel like because, oh, you know what, Melani, I don't know if folks know Melani, but she, she's an employee at Glide. She was the first person that I heard say this and it really struck me. She said um, that Pacific Islanders are the only group of people that are grouped together with their colleagues. And I was like, oh, shoot, that's so true. Um, but, you know, it is what it is. And it's our job to change that, I guess. <laughs> it is something that we're actively doing at UC Berkeley. We're actively trying to break away from the API label. Um, we're actively trying to gain visibility for ourselves so that we can offer more opportunities for generations after us. Um, yeah, so <laughs> that, yeah, that is all I have to share right now. <laughs> well, thank you, Tufo. You know, you're, you're, in, you're in great company because we, we understand, I think all of us have an idea of how sort of 
other folks have imposed what they think we should be belong to. And, and I think part of the beauty of, of being a part of a communities of color is that we, we see the beauty, our individual beauty within our cultures and we celebrate that. And um, we got you, we got you. Fui Fui Lupe, how are you? Thank you for joining us. Hey everybody. Okay, wow, okay. It's finals time. So I was uh, actually texting with uh, one of my GSIs. Um, you know, students are asking for all sorts of extensions right now. So yeah, so thanks everybody. Well, uh, yeah, first and foremost, I really want to acknowledge uh, that Malo et Daulava, Malo et Daulava Gaina, Malo et Daulava. Eh, but the bow Malo, see Malo in our life, Malo in our life, I go. No, but Malo, I lay, I go, I'm on the born. You know, and I know that it takes so much courage. I just really want to say thank you so much. I also, uh, before we start, you know, it is a, a Pacific Islander protocol. As indigenous people, we always uh, acknowledge the indigenous land that we're on. So right now I'm in a place that uh, called Huchen, but uh, that's the original name given by the Lashana Ohlone tribe, a land that's now called Oakland. Uh, so proud of Oakland, one of the best places in the world. I'm sorry for the San Francisco people. I know Glad also. Uh, yeah, so much love, of course, to all our relatives uh, in San Francisco as well. Um, you know, we're so proud of Oakland too because it's the home of the Black Panthers. I was just in a, another Zoom call earlier today and another one just yesterday where I talked about uh, the histories between the Black Panthers and the Polynesian Panthers in our Aotearoa, New Zealand, and here also in Oakland. And so also, you know, aunties uh, Sandy and also the, the, uh, the wonderful auntie, please, I can't see you right now, but really, I just wanna say thank you so much for being here. Um, really wanna also show our respect and our great love for your, your work. Thank you so much for the great work you've done on this land that's helped to open up the doors for so many of us people of color that are coming behind you. You know, relatives, I just wanna, I just wanna talk about, uh, you know, watching the video and, and some of the, the themes that I've heard so far, right? The first one that I wanted to talk about was asking for representation, right? We heard a young Asian woman talk about how she is invisibilized here in the United States, the systemic racialization and violence here in the US. And she was asking, for representation. I also heard uh, some of the wonderful, you know, Miguel, great job too, by the way, with your facilitation. I also heard you talk about radical inclusivity. So relatives, I ask you, I ask you humbly, if the purpose of this round table is radical inclusivity, is asking for representation, is asking for freedom. Then why, relatives, I ask, why wasn't there a Pacific Islander video in the beginning of this meeting that went side by side, if this was the goal, if this was the goal to pay, to honor, and to honor, it's more than just acknowledge, we could do acknowledgements, to honor these deep, these, these, these uh, populations in the United States that are highly, highly invisible, which are Asian Americans, and on the other side, Pacific Islanders. I ask you relatives, why weren't Pacific Islanders included in your short videos, short snippets of who our people are? You know, I work really closely too with many filmmakers and Pacific Islanders in communication. There are hundreds and hundreds of films the purpose of Pacific Islanders and communications is to create representations on Pacific Islander communities, Melanesians, Micronesians, and Polynesians. In fact, one of the, short, the shorts that have won all over nationally, globally, Kapu, uh, Kapu Mahu, which is about, uh, by Native Hawaiian filmmakers and is about uh, uh, um, the Mahu, the third gender in Hawaii. Has, I, I show it in my UC Berkeley class. It's less than five minutes, less than two minutes. I'm not saying we had to show that video. I'm just saying it is not a difficult job. 
It is not a difficult job. If, if, the, if the goal here, relatives, was actually radical inclusivity, then I ask how come then we weren't included? You know, I, I, I go with uh, um, the young sister, that young niece, uh, Dubo, when she talks about the difficulties it is for us, uh, Pacific peoples within API. You know, relatives, I talk about when I first came to California 20 years ago, I had just finished my master's at Purdue University in Indiana. And I came here looking for a job. The first job I took was actually one of my mentors calling me up and she said, hey, Fui, you know what? You are blessed. And I said, yeah, auntie, what's going on? What's my blessing? You know, I love blessings. And I was looking for a job. And she said, the Pacific Islander students at City College of San Francisco got together and worked with the community. They have a job for you. The job is that you can go up for it, you know, put in your application and get, an, uh, you know, put in your application. The job is, is to teach Pacific Island studies. And when I went, I went to the interview uh, relatives, you know, I thank the great creator and the ancestors, I did get that job. And I just wanted to share really quickly how that job came to be. The job was actually Pacific Islander churches of uh, Samoan, congrega Samoan congregations, native Hawaiians coming together, Tongan communities, Kiripats, uh, Palau coming together. And the reasons why is because actually they did not see themselves represented in the API studies courses at City College of San Francisco. This is my first job. My first moment that I went to Sacramento to do a testimony is actually one of the native Hawaiian elders coming to my apartment and picking me up early, early in the morning, probably about 5.30. And he said, niece, I need you to come with me. We're gonna to go to Sacramento and I need you to testify. And you know, I, you know when we're kids, you, you just, you know, this is many years ago, by the way, you know, much younger. So I was like, uncle, okay, yeah, uncle, what do you want me to do? He said, when we got there, he said, you just tell them the truth. He said, you tell them that you're a Pacific Islander and that you're not API. So relatives, including beloved Asian relatives, I stand in front of you here today as a witness, as a participant of decolonization movements, as a participant and also as a dreamer, your neighbor, a community member. I'm here also to say that we as Pacific Islanders is very, very complex. We're not included. And as Tipo says, what the label of API does is that it erases the histories of the past and present uh, uh, Asian settler colonialisms in the Pacific. It erases the current histories of not only the histories of colonization, but also it erases our refusal of this term and our resistance. Mm -hmm. And as I also say that, I also take a deep breath. I also take a deep breath. And I wanted to let you know, relatives, you know, Auntie Sandy, when you talked about your people, maybe if I could even use the word incarceration hmm. within the US uh, concentration camps, I want you to know that we people of Moana Nui, this is the indigenous name for Pacific Islanders, we people of Moana Nui stand with you against US imperialism. We're doing it right now in our own homelands and we would have done it if it happens today again and we continue to stand with you against agent hate. So thank you so much, everybody. Thank you so much and much love to all of you. Wow, Fui Lupe, thank you so much. Speaking truth. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. So Annie, we're going deep now. I, I, I enjoyed, you know, really listening to stories from our AAPI community. And I always learn, you know, something new, no matter how often do we hear these stories. Lately, uh, the statistics show that uh, since last March, the Stop Asian hate uh, report, the site reported as of now 6,600 
incidents of hate against our Asian and a lot against Asian elderly. And if you imagine like that, that's like 10 acts every day. And we know that it's underreported. So I've been very, very um, fearful, you know, as to what happens every day when I wake up, will I get a call that there's another incident uh, of violence against our community? So I'm really happy that Miguel invited me to this panel and talk about our culture because uh, AAPI Heritage Month is the one time that even non-Asians uh, will, will, will come and kind of talk about our ancestries, you know, or our accomplishments uh, and our stories. So culture is really deep, very deeply rooted in all of us. And since I'm, I was born and raised in Hong Kong, uh, culture from the very first day I was born uh, is part of me. I'm sure that some of you have been invited to a Chinese uh, friend's uh, uh, red egg and ginger party, right? Yes, yes, raise your hand if you have. <laughs> so red egg and ginger party is uh, when the baby reaches his uh, one month birthday and the proud parents and grandparents, you know, will throw a party and no matter what you serve, you always have ginger and a red egg for you to bring home. So that's, that's um, family and food and uh, respect of elders and taking care of our young children. That's, that's really part of the Chinese culture. And we are brought up to always respect and love and honor our elderly. So when, when we start to see that people are targeting our seniors for very violent crimes, right? Stabbing and murdering and pushing them. It, it really hurts, it really hurts. So during this month, I hope that all of us uh, have a resolution that if you have an Asian elderly friend, whether they're neighbors or relatives, you know, that you haven't uh, maybe talk or contact it for a while, pick up the phone tomorrow, you know, and see how they're doing, you know, take them out for dim sum. If they are uh, already, I'm sure many are vaccinated by now. If you feel safe, you know, if you feel they'll be, they'll be very happy uh, to hear from us and to be able to reconnect again. That's social uh, the whole last 15 months of COVID pandemic, the, I think that the, one of the hidden impacts is our elderly feel kind of lonely. And sometimes they might not recognize depression as we kind of talked about it, but they feel that they losing appetite, loss of sleep, you know, uh, sad instead of being happy. Then those are already uh, signs that they might be feeling depressed and uh, it's time, you know, it's really time for us to put our arms around our seniors and raise their spirit. So uh, a beautiful gift, uh, the second question that I think that I, I've been with self-help since uh, 1981, of almost 40 years. Uh, it's a long time and, but I feel that you know, when I'm with the seniors, you know, being an administrator now, don't have uh, much encounter. I still do, but you don't, you, it's not like I'm, I'm their social worker, right? And I go and visit with them every week and they're very close uh, sharing their life stories with me. So being an administrator, I always find opportunities to go and, and still, um, just be with, with, with the elderly. So yesterday, the Academy of Science uh, in uh, fighting back this anti-Asian, anti-senior uh, hate violence invited 150 of our seniors in three days. Yesterday was the first field trip to the Academy of Science. So 50 seniors from Chinatown uh, arrived at the Academy and they were like kids, right? They can, they can, rush to see the, 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 the rainforest and the penguins. And uh, they were so happy that I have to uh, really 
get every one of them. When the bus arrived at about 3.30, we were there since about one o'clock uh, to get them home. So just, just simple, simple gestures like this that I, uh, the COO at the Academy did, which is to invite seniors to just spend an afternoon, you know, with snacks, uh, just, just will brighten up their day. So I hope that all of us will do that, not just during May, not just during this month, but every month. So that will be um, a, a real gift that we will give ourselves you know, to the community. So uh, sorry, I wasted a lot of the time in fixing the mic. So I'll stop there and then pick it up again on the Q&A. God, thank you so much, Annie. And no worries, um, you were family. <laughs> um, you know, I love the fact that Fulvio Lupe was asked, referring to us as relatives. Um, because we're, we're all kin. At least we have to see each other as kin and all our relations. So this is, this is good. Um, you, know, you know, it was really, really, it's a difficult thing to um, try to get people to understand that it's not about one month. You know, we have a lot of people now are on this diversity inclusion equity inclusion kick, right? Where everyone's trying to do it, but they almost act like it's a nine to five Monday through Friday thing when it shouldn't be. It should be 24 seven. And even in the most uncomfortable moments, we need to lean into that and grow and learn from each other. And so we're hoping through these different, not only just with this, but in everything we're doing at Glide to try to help get people to, to live these, these, these values. So um, I just want to thank all four of you, um, as well as all your ancestors that have formed you and have informed you to be the leader you are today. And the gifts that you bring, not only to just sort of make us smile, but also make us think about what can we do to be better. Um, so now we're going to go to sort of some questions that that we had. We want to pose to the to the panelists, and it's sort of popcorn style. So whoever wants to to sort of share, um, you know, what would you want to share with those people who are not part of the community? What would you want them to know about your not only your culture but your peoples? Right, so that people have a bit. Um, that's the first question we'll throw out. Who would like to to answer that or to share? I can Tufo? share. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think when I think about uh you know, the Pacific Islander community and maybe some stereotypes that are attached to uh, to our peoples. I think one of the things that I would like for folks to know is that like, we're not in, as intimidating as you think. <laughs> I think that uh, a lot of folks find this to be unapproachable. Um, I feel like it's, it's actually like two, it's, it's completely polar opposites. The kinds of reactions we get to our folks is like, either like really um, open and like people think we're the nicest folks on the planet, but then to people who are not familiar with Pacific Islanders at all, they think that we're like big and scary and intimidating. Um, I think I would just want folks to know that as a Tongan, um, as a Pacific Islander, our people are like one of the most loving people. Uh, we are very humble people. Um, and one, another thing I've learned just in the past maybe five years um, of doing community work, I've learned that conflict is not a bad thing. I learned that, um, you know, arguments are okay and that there will be disagreements uh, when working together, but it's, a, it's, a, it's the arguments and it's the disagreements that help grow a better and stronger relationship. And, and I feel like that is a huge part of being Pacific Islander is, is recognizing that and recognizing that these things can make us stronger together. Um, 
And so I just hope <laughs> that, you know, moving forward, people can welcome us openly um, and not be afraid of what we have to bring to the table. Thank you. Sandy, you wanna share anything? Uh, you know, I, I wanted to raise a question, Miguel, if, if I may, because I wanna try to understand better the points that Tupu and Fui Fui made in relationship to, you know, the term API is something that you don't necessarily relate to. I want to have a better understanding of what you meant by that. In other words, because uh, to me, uh, it's a learning thing for me to hear that. And, um, you know, I work in the field of aging. And so I'm always looking for uh, areas where there's a need for services to seniors. And uh, my, uh, one of my observations is that in the Pacific Islander community, there are not a lot of culturally relevant senior services. And, um, and, I, and I know there, the churches is the key factor in, in, in your communities. Uh, and that I, I would hope that there would be more communication between representatives of the churches who represent the Pacific Islander communities, because there are many different groups within the Pacific Islander community, Tongans, Samoans, right, Fijians. So, so to, to put together programs that are culturally and linguistically appropriate, I think the city needs to spend more effort to doing that because I don't, I don't see necessarily programs that uh, the Pacific Islander community relate to. And, and I may be way off, and if I am, tell me, but uh, this is something I've been talking with within the field of aging. Um, and, and I do things citywide in, in areas of aging, not just my community. Uh, and that's why Annie and I have worked together for many years in terms of citywide issues. Um, so kind of enlighten me on some of these things that I'm raising. I may be way off. Okay. Um, that is a great question. And, I, and I'm glad that you asked that because I feel like it's not asked enough. Um, Personally, I can't, I can't speak for all Pacific Islanders, of course. Personally, I, I don't identify as API um, simply because I, I cannot, I don't see how Asian American and Pacific Islander are synonymous. Um, while we share like very similar cultural values um, and maybe even some cultural practices, I think because API is a very US specific term, it means something completely different more than just how we identify ourselves culturally, right? Uh, because API is used to determine so many other things like um, the resources or like funding that certain programs get um, and how those things are distributed amongst our, our API uh, population. Um, and while, while there are a lot of Asian Americans in different, uh, you know, vendors, different sectors who perform um, like very well, there's always going to be Pacific Islanders who fall through the cracks because we don't receive those certain resources because we don't perform as well. Um, and so it's, I, I feel like, uh, the question isn't like, how can we create better programming or resources to, to better serve Pacific Islanders within an API um, space? I think the question is how can we get like, you know, the government and, and other institutions to recognize that these two things just don't go together. Um, yeah, that's all I'll say about that. Because you know, at one time, at when when the first uh, years ago, when the term came up, Asian American, 
I always felt that Asian American is not a race, it's a political term that we're put into this box and we're all put you know, in, in, in that to describe a group of people uh, from the different countries who represent Asia. So to me, it was just a term that was a political term because it wasn't a race. And, and except now when we have uh, many, many intermarriages, interrelation, interrelation marriages, that you have children who are multiracial, then it, then it says, asks me, well, okay, now do we have such a, such a term Asian American becoming a race? I mean, that's just a question, uh, but, but um, uh, go going back to the Pacific Islander community, that if there are ways that you feel that there needs to be more outreach and more sensitive outreach, because it can't, it can't, it can't be outreach just for outreach purposes. It's got to be sensitive to uh, the different peoples and the different cultures within the Pacific Islander community. You know, I, I think I think your question is so uh, important to this conversation, Sandy. Um, but I also think part of the 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 answer is we need to get the government to recognize yeah. the the diversity and that let people stand on their own. Yeah. Let let community don't put us all in, in little boxes. I mean, Latinos, Mexicans are different than Guatemalans. Right. Different than, you know, people from Argentina. Right. And then you have Brazil, and then you have all the indigenous communities. It's, so I think this is a good sort of task for us to think about at Glide um, in the sense of how do we begin to sort of bang that drum. So. Um, like I told you all backstage, you, you guys, we're all, we're in this together now. So we, let's see what we can, what we can do. But I think it's an important question. And one that I think we, we also have to learn from um, at Glide, right? So I, I appreciate this conversation. Any others with um, thoughts about stuff you would love for people to have a better understanding of? Um, Hi, Miguel and everybody on the panel. This is Janice. Oh, oh hi, Jen. Hi. I don't hi. usually talk without makeup, but I'm going to make an exception on this being that I am AAPI and have been, you know, classified in this uh, acronym, but it's never been ever acknowledged how complicated uh, we are as an Asian American Pacific Islander, East Asian, and you know, a war-torn um, target for so many centuries in regards to imperialist wars, particularly from many, many countries, including, and the biggest, maybe the biggest, America. Um, so we've been demonized on many levels. So I think that it's so complex and it requires a great deal more discussion. Um, because we need to acknowledge how many of us feel that we have been marginalized. And I applaud everybody on the panel. I'm sorry I could not access you. Sandy Mori is my shiro, as is Annie Chung and all of you on the panel. Thank you, Mwah! Pacific Islander sisters and brothers. Uh, Y'all great. And Miguel, thank you for bringing us together. But we have so many things to discuss. There are so many issues that we need to look at including what is being done with African-Americans. They're being marginalized. I mean, they're being like, yeah, as African-Americans, but there's Jamaicans, there's, uh, I mean, so many different people who are considered black, who are a, var a variety of cultures. So it's a great beginning of a great discussion. Thank you for starting it. Thank and I'm gonna shut up. Thank you, Jan. Thank you. So those of you who don't know, this is Janice Merkin, one of the founders of Glide. Um, 
poet laureate of San Francisco, truth teller, truth seeker, an inspiration <laughs> uh, to all of us. So thank you for joining us, Janice. We really well, love you and thank you so much for having us. Um, so good to see you, Jan. So the, the second question we had was, um, let me get back to it. Um, how, how, you know, I think we're on a roll in the sense that we're really digging up some, some issues here that we need to, to talk about and call out. Um, how do you, what would you suggest to those of us who are neither Pacific Islander, neither Asian, neither Southeast Asian, right? What could we do to be better allies um, in this, this ongoing struggle? Let's see, who would like to speak? Well, Miguel, my first reaction to that question is for everyone to be open to learning and to be open to learning new things and, you know, getting exposed to new people <laughs> and, uh, and have your heart open and be willing to communicate. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Nancy Sandy. Um, I, if I could just piggyback on that and also just a big, you know, so much respect, so much uh, uh, by Maloy and Ngawelahi uh, uh, to Janice Marikitani. You know, your work really, really changed my life in so many ways. What a great honor it is um, to see you. And also um, my students absolutely love your work too. So thank you so much. What a great, great living ancestor you are. You know, I, maybe maybe what I just wanted to say really briefly, uh, 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 Miguel, if I can, um, about the beautiful gift that my community has for the world. It's actually, it's, uh, I'm gonna piggyback on something that Janice Murray Katani also brought up, right? Uh, talking about the lives of also uh, that Black Lives Matters. And I, I wanted to say that for us in the Pacific and Oceania, Black Lives Matters because that uh, the Black Pacific is also who we are. Um, what the Pacific is, is, so it's three, you know, Oceania is three different uh, uh, regions of uh, regions. There's Polynesia, where Tupo and I are from. There's also uh, Micronesia, right? That will be like where Guam, many of us here in the US also know Guam. Uh, um, and also then there's uh, Melanesia or the Black Pacific. This is where uh, 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 Vanuatu, maybe also Fiji and also uh, where one of the most powerful and one of the most uh, profound uh, social justice movements are happening right now. And that is the Free West Papua Movement. And uh, the Free West Papua Movement is, is a, you, you know, what we're seeing with the Free West Papua Movement is that it's bringing all the Pacific together. So the Pacific and the three regions that I just described were actually severed. This was part of our colonialism. Uh, where Polynesia, where, where Hawaii is, is part of New Zealand. These are the parts that most of you know here in the US. And the other places, especially the Black Pacific, uh, I mean, these are brothers and sisters are really, are really dark skinned people. And we're so proud of this, of their, of their Blackness, right? And in this movement, uh, in, in uh, West Papua has got the world's uh, most, uh, excuse me, highest reserves of oil, right? Oil, gold mines, copper, and ore, right? And right now also, uh, because of the green economy, they also, their lands are also exploited for uh, palm oil. And so uh, just, just really briefly, what I just wanted to say is that it's really brought all of us. This is an issue because they are one of the most marginalized parts of the Pacific. It's really opened up all our hearts. It's really brought up uh, Christians, right? Uh, so many of us indigenous peoples to the forefront uh, fighting for the freedom uh, to free West Papua. And really you can find that uh, a hashtag free West Papua on social media. And again, the, the big issues with that uh, brothers and sisters that is of great importance to us is because uh, um, again, resistance against uh, our, our colon colonizers. You, you know, Sandy, I was just thinking about something also that you were saying. Um, and also uh, Janice Marikatani, 
right? Just like uh, the movements now, right? These movements against resistance. It's also awakened a US, uh, lots of US activists because also it falls with the Black Lives Matters, right? And you're having these Melanesians uh, who are black people from the Pacific who are an important part of our relatives and an important part of our Pacific family. So if I could say something that we're really proud of, something that's a beautiful gift for us, it's our Melanesian brothers and sisters. It's the gift of resistance that they're bringing us an opportunity for us to stand with them and to show our solidarity with our black Pacific. And it's the same kind of love, Janice, it's the same kind of love that we bring to our brothers and sisters here in Oakland, to Black Lives Matters as well that we love you so much. We love you so much. And we're here, we're here, Mona New stands with Black Lives Matters. Wow. Mm. Thank you, Fufu Lope. Someone actually, I was Rose Arieta put the website for the freewestpopo.org. Um, and you know what? I, I think maybe what we can do, because now that we're sort of getting back into um, uh, where we'll hopefully be able to, to be together, uh, maybe we can do a session at Glide to educate more folks on the movement. Um, Glide has always been a place of movement building and this would be a wonderful opportunity for us uh, to come together and, and um, let's, let's share that information with, with people. So we're getting towards the end. I'm not sure if Annie, you wanted to say anything or you're good. Uh, I, I'm worried about the mic. <laughs> oh no, you're good now. <laughs> I, I just want to say there's so much for us to learn and support each other. I think that we could be allies, you know, like really uh, we have differences, but we have more commonalities probably than differences because our values, right, are very similar, um, and then because of the because of the of the of the community that's really grounded in us, uh, we could almost come to your events and you could come to ours uh, without any walls and without any barriers. I think we really, like Sandy said, we need to be open, open-hearted, and open-minded, and reach reach across and and show people that particularly for me, we have to, we have to do something to stop all this hatred virus that is poisoning, uh, poisoning our, our community. So thank you for all of your support of our seniors. There's been outpouring of support and people wanting to volunteer, people wanting to, to help. So let's just do it all, all together. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Well, this has been a, a, an awesome evening in the most humblest of ways um, because we're hearing truth, but behind that truth, there's a lot of love. Love for our own communities, but love for each other's communities. And I think that's the glue, right? That's the glue that is gonna keep us together. Even when you have folks who are trying to fight and hurt us, um, we, we will stand with each other. And that's, that's more powerful than anything is that unconditional love that we have. Um, for our audience, I told you, we have warriors and prophets and prophets and warriors. You heard some prophesizing from our, 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 our elders and our warriors and you heard some warrior spirit in our young. And that's what it's about. Right, so we want to thank you, um, but we we have our incredible Hawaiian artists extraordinaire, uh, Patrick Landeza. Uh, for those of you that, that missed his first song earlier today, uh, we're gonna have this video up on our website, so you'll be able to capture that. But Patrick, brother. If you could send us off on a, on a wonderful way, in a wonderful way. Absolutely. And thank you guys. I, I really enjoyed it. Uh, and uh, I, I go pretty far back with, with, uh, with Fui and I just love you to pieces, girl. I, I really, that was like a lot of knowledge. Um, and me being Filipino, 
uh, Chinese, Irish, Hawaiian, right? It, it's, it's just like, you hit it right on the money. The face of, 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 of Hawaiians are, are, are different and never, never judge the book by its cover. And I was always judged by the cover, but never by, by what's inside. So that was, that was some great knowledge. I leave you, um, I don't want to sing. I actually want to leave you with this simply slack key, but reflect on what you heard today and take it with you. Be it, but most importantly, for the ancestors. So take this time to reflect. I send you an all aloha, which is the true meaning, as my mother would say, is unconditional love. So aloha to you all, and mahalo for the knowledge to all of the panelists, and mahalo for the invitation. Blessings. <laughs> Until the next time, my sisters and brothers, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good evening. Thank you, Miguel. Hey, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We love you guys. Thank you so much. Thank you.